I'd like to thank the organizers for asking me to talk about an adaptive pathway development for one of the lysosomal storage disorders, Fabry disease. First of all, I will show you my disclosures. Um, I am involved in pre-marketing research with pharmaceutical companies. Um, and I have also been part of the um, platform Medicine for Society, which is part of the Amsterdam UMC uh, over the last couple of years. So although it is a very specific topic that I'm going to talk about today, um, I would like to tell you a little bit about the background of lysosomal storage disorders, which makes you understand why we at um, a certain point developed a pathway like this or a scheme for a pathway. Now, what you see here on the right hand side is a cell. And as you probably know, the cell has a garbage disposal system to keep the interior neat and tidy. And for that, we need the lysosomes, which can digest macromolecules. And within the lysosomes are many enzymes, which you can see them here. And they have uh, the ability to catalyze uh, reactions to break down macromolecules. If there is a defect in one of those enzymes, there will be a buildup of storage material, which will then result in a lysosomal storage disorder. Now there are many enzymes, so there are also many disorders. And you can see here some examples of them very, very differently, not only in between, the disorders, but also within the disorder. That means that the phenotypic diversity is enormous. So on the top, you can see, for example, Gachet disease, a very severely affected child, but also a nearly asymptomatic octogenarian. And the same holds true for almost all of the uh, lysosomal storage disorders. I'm telling you this because it's important if you want to develop a treatment strategy, which I show here as the first one for Gaucher disease. One of the enzymes that is defect there uh, is uh, glucoserbosidase. And you see here, Professor Roscoe Brady, who developed the enzyme, uh, who discovered the enzyme defect in the 60s of last century, and also helped to develop the enzyme replacement therapy. He's injecting a child with the enzyme as we speak here on the um, um, the figure. And the effect has been very, very successful. You can see on the right hand side that there is extreme organomegaly in these patients. They have huge spleens and livers, and that is reversible. But also, there were not only dramatic effects, but also dramatic prices. And uh, already in these early days, there was some criticism about this high price of the drug, which could be more than $300,000 per patient per year. Now, after this success um, in Gaucher disease, that has paved the way for the development of several other enzyme replacement therapies. And if you look in one of the reviews, you can see that people um, find these enzyme replacement therapies in general to be safe and effective for uh, several of the disorders, including Gaucher, but also Fabry disease, mucopolysaccharidosis, and Pompe disease. But I think uh, we should have an open eye for the real world situation. And that situation is quite different because in fact, treatment is not a cure, not for any of the disorders, even not for Gaucher disease. And um, as I said, the phenotypes can be extremely variable. Also, that would probably mean that the natural disease progression is also very variable. And that is a challenge to say when uh, or with, with what dose a patient should be treated. Because the effects probably would depend on the timing and the disease severity. So open questions are, what is the window of opportunity for treatment for each of these disorders? And also, if it doesn't work, uh, does it mean that early treatment would work? That has not always been proven. And another important issue is that screening initiatives emerged after these treatments came, became available, revealing many, many patients with very, very mild phenotypes that maybe do not 
need any treatment at all. So for these open questions at the time, we already found it necessary that there were more independent collaborative efforts for an appropriate use of uh, these therapies. And we were very fortunate in the 90s of last century to receive some funding, some public funding from the Ziekenfondsraad, which is currently the National Healthcare Institute, to do studies on those findings, biomarkers, long-term complications for Gaucher disease, where we could establish, for example, that uh, individualization of treatment is quite possible. And it's not just possible, it also is very effective and it saves a lot of money. The disorder that came after Gaucher was Fabry disease, which is quite a different uh, disorder, although the stored lipid um, is quite similar to what we see in Gaucher disease. The storage is in other cells. It is in vascular wall cells, in the heart, in the kidney, so it has more of a, a vascular type of uh, um, expression with renal failure, strokes, cardiac failure, acroparesthesias. You can see here a boy who's comforting his, um, his brother who has very painful acroparesthesias in his feet. Here are the typical features of um, um, the face of a February male and a thickened heart that you can see in February disease. It is an X-linked disorder. So um, from that only there, you would expect large differences between males and females. And indeed that is the case. So if we look at the disease course in February disease, in this graph, you can see, for example, that in non-classical, that means females with um, a very high residual enzyme activity, they can be completely asymptomatic. Well, we also have a group of males that have some residual enzyme activity and uh, females that come from a severely affected family. They have a similar disease course. And then we have the classically affected males. And as I already gave away a little bit, that relates very well to the residual enzyme activity and also the amount of storage material. And we could measure storage material in the plasma as a very good biomarker, an indication of the severity of the phenotype. Now, enzyme therapy has been developed for February disease already uh, more than two decades uh, ago. And interestingly, there are two preparations that were developed, agalcidase alpha, which was then studied in a short clinical trial and received market authorization in 2001. And because it was a conditional approval, there was a registry set up by the company for that. But the, at the same time, there was um, a Galcidase Beta from another company that had at the same day a market authorization under exceptional circumstances with another registry. Both of these enzymes came with a price tag of 200,000 euros per patient per year. But still, as in the other um, dis um, disorders, we could see that there were many open questions. So what is the dose? Um, what patient uh, do we need to treat? At what time uh, should we treat these patients? These were all questions that were not resolved at that time. Nevertheless, um, in our country, because of the high price, after some years, there uh, people wanted to know whether there was a cost-effective treatment. And we, uh, with support by um, Zonenwe, uh, performed an HDA study based on our Dutch cohort. And we very carefully selected untreated controls from um, the historical files that were very well matched with our treated patients. And we could figure out that there was indeed some effect, especially some delay in treatment, and the treatment gave some delay in the development of complications. On the right hand side, you see a little bit of the scheme of the Markov state transition model that we developed with uh, Marcel Dijkgraaf and because of the, the, the effectiveness being limited, 
with that high price, the cost effectiveness analysis showed a very, very high price per quality between five and a half and seven and a half million. So um, that was at the beginning of that kind of discussion on what a life should be worth. And there was a media uproar because the, um, um, the Healthcare Institute at that time had a preliminary advice to stop the reimbursement of enzyme replacement therapy, not just for Febrile disease, but also for Pompe disease in our country. And as I said, that, that rose some questions like what's a year of life worth? And so um, that sort of um, set the scene that these kinds of treatment should be monitored better and that we should also have the ability to sort of more stratify our patients and more selectively give that treatment. Now, as I said, there was, were some obligations from the EMA to set up registries to also look at the effectiveness uh, on um, the long term. Um, we had the Fabry Outcome Survey from Shire and also the Fabry Registry from Genzyme. And as I will show you, these registries were very well managed, but they were also uh, lacking a lot of data that were um, important to answer this kind of question. So again, with the help of Zonome, uh, we received some uh, funding to set up an independent registry in our GGG project. And you can see the title here. And we were able in collaboration with um, centers from London, Würzburg, Canada, and our center and support from the patient organization to set up a database with almost 600 patients. So in our database, we had data on both of the preparations. The phenotypes were uniformly defined. We had um, full records of clinical symptoms for almost more than five years. And importantly, we also had biochemistry outcomes that would help us to uh, look at effects based upon surrogate markers. Now, our PhD student, Martin Arens, is shown here, who could, for the first time now, very clearly show that the natural course of patients, so untreated patients, was very, very different between classical males and on the one hand side and non-classical females on the other side. So the proportion of patients with major clinical complications you can see on the left-hand side is, is very, very different. And also, for example, renal dysfunction, which is a major risk factor for development of future complications and also a major indicator that treatment is not going to be effective anymore, is in fact only seen in classical males and only in a very, very small proportion of other patients. So that of, of course means that you need to stratify your patients. So what you, I show here is what has happened between 2001 and all the years after. Initially, we thought it was potentially effective for all patients. Then it's perhaps not effective in advanced disease, maybe not in patients with cardiac fibrosis, or renal failure. Then here, the studies were done that it is not cost effective. We also found that antibodies may interfere and that there are certain risk factors for non-responders. In the meantime, there were screening uh, studies uh, that revealed many non-classical patients. Well, we have found out, and others as well, that non-classical females have a very benign course. So, it took 20 years, as you can see here, for a good independent consensus on start and stop criteria based upon independent studies. And I think this is an important background where we came from to say that we could do this differently. So maybe with adaptive pathways to patients, um, you could develop um, a strategy that you could um, gather evidence over time and then have also progressive licensing. 
Well, this has been already launched in, I believe, 2015 as a proposal by EMA. And it requires an active early dialogue with reg regulators, but also HTA patients, healthcare professionals. And very importantly, you need to use real world data to supplement the clinical trial data. And the principle is, of course, to have an iterative development. So initial focus on a narrow patient population and then perhaps expansion to a wider population. But as I said, um, you need a, um, um, also some, uh, a very good uh, way to collect real world data. What we did in our study is just develop a sort of theoretical scheme that could be followed, could have been followed for Fabry disease, which was uh, published in Drug Discovery Today by Yvonne Schiller. And what you see here is, I think what all of you know as the traditional scenario. So pre-marketing consultation is um, especially between industry and regulators. Then a clinical trial is performed in a, a restricted uh, population, in this case, mainly in classical males. And then there will be a conditional marketing approval at one time point. And after that, the effectiveness is in the hands of industry in different drug registries, um, where the evidence generation can be very, very difficult. And results are reported to the EMA and not directly to healthcare professionals or to patients. So there is no alignment of these parties and that will uh, result in continuing doubts on cost effectiveness, which may in the end hamper patients' access to medicine. So the real world experience sort of is um, not connected to what's happening in this situation here. So we have, based upon the principles that were already uh, set out by the EMA, developed an alternative scheme, an improved scenario that would um, build on those elements with an iterative development where all stakeholders agree on an early stage on data development plan. Uh, trials were done in, will be done in patients that likely benefit most, so these could have an early license and then further studies are needed to see where other patients with other um, um, expression of the disease could also benefit from treatment. So that um, requires a, a very, very rigid and, and, and well-maintained disease registry, which is not for drugs, but for patients. And for that reason, we feel it's very important that such a registry is led by an independent board and already set up in the pre-marketing phase. So hopefully, if you start that, you can also already at an early stage collect data that are important for HTA so that um, HTA assessments can um, immediately um, be performed um, on um, at the same time or quickly thereafter when we have a more, a better view on the real world data. So, um, as I said, the um, uh, registry, an independent registry is um, crucial to our, um, um, we are convinced that that is very, very important and we also uh, reported already on that and on the features of such post or authorization registries in the past in 2015. So you can see what we felt from a healthcare professional uh, point of view, what is important as elements of these authorization post authorization registries. Um, Another thing that I think we should uh, mention here is that not just the process of approval, but also the process of access could be improved. So um, on the EU level, there I think could be improvements, but um, 
of course, we need to um, realize that payers will also uh, need an assurance that what they are going to reimburse is indeed effective. So for orphan drugs, we are now in the process of developing um, a scheme or um, a project that has elements of the Dutch drug access protocol um, that um, allows early but uh, controlled access to treatment. And the idea is that you should signal already months before market approval that a new drug is uh, coming to the market where you can develop a protocol with a rare disease expert center. And then in a dialogue with insurance companies and also supported by patients. And of course the pharmaceutical company come to a sort of scheme where you already um, um, can start early on to treat patients on an individual basis. And if this patient uh, proves to have a benefit um, based on preset criteria, then the reimbursement can be taken over uh, by insurance companies. And over a, a preset course of time, you can also collect data, not only from your center, but maybe international in a registry to eventually say whether this treatment is really effective enough to be um, completely taken up in the insured package. So coming to an end of my talk, the conclusions of what I've shown you here today is that uh, with the increasing number of orphan drugs, we really need new pathways towards early conditional approval at EU level, but also alternative routes to access at the national level. And no surprise, this requires early dialogues with all the stakeholders and a robust system of evidence generation with independent registries, but also at the same time to not have further delays in development of national systems of access. Thank you for your attention.